So like Fiona said, um, our first speaker today is going to be Rink Herkstra. He's going to outline a, a case that he experienced um, to do with editorial misconduct or misbehaviors. So I'll just quickly, uh, he's also based in, in the Netherlands and unfortunately can't be with us today. So he's pre-recorded a video for us. So I'll just share that now. Hopefully everybody can see. First of all, thank you, Dan, for organizing this session and for. No check is can everyone hear that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Fighting me, I think this is a very relevant and important topic that we do not discuss often enough. And my role here is to talk about one particular case of clear editorial misconduct. When this happened about ten years ago. I finished my dissertation a few years before, and I was still in the process of trying to publish a few of the unpublished chapters. And one of these chapters was uh, was on the um, on comparing the interpretation of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests in, in a similar situation. It doesn't really matter for for this story, but well, we deemed this paper uh, appropriate for uh, the journal Educational and Psychological Measurement, and. For years, I've been a bit hesitant to talk about this publicly and also to, to publicly name and shame a journal and um, the, the, the editor of this journal, uh, but I've decided to, to do it anyway. And, and the reason for that, the way I've justified it for myself, is that I think that editors have a lot of power in the current academic system. And I don't think I'm punching down when talking about this. I, I think I'm punching up, and I think we're. It's important enough because, well, the issue okay, is important. Dan, can pause it for so a second. We can't you don't have to agree with me, but this is the. Just, I think your windows are covering the slides. We can see your cursor. So the whole screen was black for a minute there. You might just want to keep the other windows closed. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Can we see it again? Reason why I do mention. Good. Good now. Okay. The journal, the publisher, and, and the editor. Okay, so I submitted this uh, paper. It was reviewed within a month, uh, and I received um, uh, so two reviews and an editorial decision. So it was quick, but the sad part was it wasn't positive. So the email that I got from George Marcolides, the editor at that time, and still the editor of the journal, was uh, well, you don't have to read the, the entirety of it, but but basically, uh, rejection of the paper without a chance to resubmit. Uh, I'm not optimistic that a rewrite would improve matters. So apparently, it was bad enough to reject it straight away. Okay, so we were thinking about well, where to submit next, and then something weird happened because I received an email on the very same day that I received it, this rejection from Fiona Fittler, who I knew from two previous conferences that we both visited and where we were both in the same session. Um, and she asked like, um, she, she, she wrote an email and she said, uh, I reviewed a paper of yours, I think it was from you, it was anonymous, but I recognized it from this, uh, from this conference we were both visiting. And I wondered what the status was of, of, this, uh, of this paper. And I wrote back like, oh, curious that you don't um, didn't receive uh, the reviews and the, the decision, but it was rejected. And well, then I had to wait another day because well, the time differences between Europe and Australia. And then I received like seven emails from Fiona uh, saying, uh, ranging from, hey, I'm sorry for you to, well, there is something really bad going on. Um, so she could compare her reviews with the reviews that, or with the review that she submitted. And it was clear to her that the two were completely different, or not completely different, but quite different. At least they did not match, which you would expect. And they did not differ on tiny uh, details, but there were some clear differences, which I will show in a minute. So, what was different between the two reviews? Well, uh, Fiona wrote in her review um, 
I believe one of the first sentences, such studies are immensely important at this stage in, psycho uh, in psychology statistical reform. And this one is a good example. So apparently she was pretty uh, positive about my paper. What I received from the journal was such studies can be, not are, but can be immensely important. Apparently this one was not. And indeed, this one still needs work. This was a sentence that she did not write. Another example. Uh, she wrote, below are some minor concerns. I did not receive the sentence, so it was just removed, which changes the tenor of the uh, of a review quite a bit, especially when the not so negative or, or the slightly, uh, or the constructive remarks she made were turned into negative remarks. And it was also a completely new paragraph. Um, the entire paragraph is new, but I highlighted a part here. Uh, here is where I would see the problem. Participants in a study are not a clear different population of resources. Well, again, I'm not gonna talk about a particular study, but um, this happened to coincide with comments of the only other reviewer. So there were two reviewers, and now the two uh, reviews were more similar than they were before, which uh, makes the decision for an editor a little bit easier. At least that is my speculation why this happened in the first place. So what did the editor respond? Because how did he respond? Because of course, Fiona approached him and he said, well, uh, yeah, let me mention that a similar incident occurred before where the system somehow blended and even distorted reviewer comments on a manuscript. Sounds very, very weird indeed. Uh, hard to believe actually. And well, he said, I come back to this in a few, uh, to the, to the, in a couple of days, and he did. And then he wrote, well, this email, which includes one of the weirdest paragraphs I've ever read, which is this one. I am told that on very rare occasions when the system uh, is undergoing maintenance and several, uh, several editors are simultaneously processing papers, the links between individual reviewer documents submitted to the journal and forwarded to an editor can be modeled. You don't have to be an academic to completely uh, or immediately see that this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Nobody would believe this, I think. This apparently occurs more frequently when strings of characters across documents bear overlapping similarities. There's a lot of words here, but it doesn't have any meaning. This is completely uh, made up, I would say. And it's not only me saying it, years later, he implicitly, the, the editor that is, implicitly admitted that it, that it changed. So what happened? I was asked to resubmit. Um, suddenly, the, the uh, rejected without a chance to resubmit turned into, well, relatively minor revisions. So it was easy to publish the paper after that. You could say that's also an ethical issue and I should have refused. Maybe at this stage of my career, I would, would have done that. But then I didn't have tenure and, and publications were too important for me. So, so I did accept it which you can criticize me for. Um, and after a week, it wasn't sent back to reviewers. So after a week, uh, I received confirmation that the paper was accepted. And then luckily Sage requested the editor to step down. No, of course they did not. Um, again, in an interview years later, our journalist asked uh, Sage what they did. And they say, well, we addressed the issue directly with the editor at the time. Because, of course, Fiona made them aware of it. She sent them an email and they said, well, we will, we'll, this is unacceptable and we'll, we'll do something. And well, basically, she never heard back. Then, for years, nothing happened. And uh, Fiona and I contemplated what to do with it. And, and as, well, we never really knew what to do. And then at some point, we came across a journalist uh, Kathleen O'Grady, uh, and she was willing to um, to publish about this, and, and among others. Um, so this particular case was uh, was mentioned uh, in a piece that she published last year. Marco Lidus was asked to give a response, and here is his admission of guilt, I think, but it's very weak. Uh, in hindsight, I should have contacted her rather than attempting to resolve the problem on my own. Note that this is something completely different than the modeling of two um, 
similar texts or something, whatever he, he said back then. And so here he, he basically admits that he resolved the problem on his own, which is basically saying, I wrote other sentences. Um, and then he says, uh, still sometimes he edits reports for clarity or to remove inappropriate language. He doesn't say it explicitly, but it's almost, it's, by equating the two, it almost sounds like, well, I try to make um, the, 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 the review of, of uh, Fiona clearer and, and maybe I removed inappropriate language. He doesn't say so, but, but apparently uh, he did it for, um, well, for good reasons. Um, and, and of course, I don't, uh, I don't believe he did. Okay, so to wrap up, some final remarks. Uh, you could say, well, why talk about this? This happened 10 years ago, and that, that's true. Maybe something changed in the meantime. Well, the editor, George Makulidis, still holds his position. And from the outside, at least, I can't see anything changing with this journal. Of course, I don't publish there anymore, but, but um, if you look at the policies, it doesn't seem to have changed. And yes, it is anecdotal, and we have to be aware of that. I'm by no means am I saying, well, this happens regularly. I, I have no idea about that. Or well, maybe Dan can talk about that later, but but we 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 don't know a lot about that yet. But I do still think it's relevant. First of all, because apparently this can happen in the current uh, this can happen in in the current academic system. And Apparently, we also condone it. We, we, we also maybe even enable it. We, we, uh, even after uh, it happened um, and it was made public, nothing happened. So I was, 10 years ago, I would have said, well, uh, and maybe even a few years ago, I would have said the self-correcting mechanism eventually solves this, right? Uh, if it's found out, if it's made public, of course, they get rid of him. They did not. So apparently, we don't think this is important enough to, to justify uh, strong measures in case of this. So I think this points to a lack of accountability uh, in academia. And I think this is a topic that we should discuss more. Thank you for your attention. OK, we're going to move straight into Dan's talk next. I'll just start sharing my screen. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Uh, yep, we do have a couple of black blocks in the round of the slides though, Dan. Is that? Up at the top in the right hand corner, some gray squares. Okay. Mm. Is that any better? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, just to follow up what Rink, Rink's presentation, what I thought might be good would be just to um, give a little bit of background on some of some of the issues that are in this space, obviously um, to talk also about some of the things that, that Rink had mentioned specifically, but um, I thought it might be nice to start before we get into to Ginny's talk on, on COPE and what COPE is just to go through some of the topics that we talk about when we talk about um, unethical practices in editing in, in, uh, in terms of publication practices. So just to get straight into it, um, this is probably a bit of a strong, a strong quote, but um, the former editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, once said about 10 plus years ago, what is called, what has been called the age of accountability, editors have continued to be as unaccountable as kings, but stories of editorial misconduct are growing. And as I was writing these slides, I was thinking, um, as I was watching talks like uh, the ones with Elizabeth Bick and James Heathers, I noticed that we often talk about, when we talk about unethical practices or erroneous, erroneous practices, we usually talk about the authors or the scientists. Um, so, you know, Elizabeth Bick said this morning about the number of people who, who do image manipulation and 
And Adam Marcus talked about um, Fennelli's finding of 2% of people admit to misconduct, those kinds of things. And I think on the back of this, we tend to put editors and peer review in this role of, of catching fraud and, and policing the literature. So it's probably not surprising that we see about 95, well, almost 100% of people or researchers in, in STEM and um, social sciences believe that editors and editorial boards are, are jointly or entirely responsible for managing these issues. But what we also notice over the last 20 years is we, we hear more and more of these practices, um, no doubt due to the ease in which people can communicate um, things like this through, through things like Twitter and, and PubPeer and the great job that Retraction Watch does. But given just how opaque peer review is in general, it's not surprising that peer review scholars consider trying to understand and investigate editorial misbehavior as a, as a high difficulty and high priority research area. So some of the common practices I think most people are probably familiar with that tend to get a lot of airtime is uh, requests for citations. So there's been a few surveys of, of academics and uh, researchers about this and, and in one by Will Height and Fong, they found that 20% you know, of over 6,000 researchers had said that they had previously been coerced or strongly suggested to, to cite literature from a journal. Um, so one of the, the examples that they give you know, is that you cite leukemia only once in 42 references. So could we please ask you to add more references to, to leukemia? So obviously this is an egregious example, but um, there are other maybe reasonable examples of, uh, you know, if there's been a bit of a scholarly oversight or some, some important literature that's been missed, you can understand why people might do this. Similarly, we've noted um, editors publishing in their own journals, original work, and in a survey that we did, we found that 87% uh, of the editors that we surveyed were, were supportive of this for, for some or all editors. And again, um, you know, while we wouldn't think too much about submission of editorials, um, you know, when it starts to get prolific, I think Dorothy Bishop did a, a blog about this calling them PPOPs, I think that's what she called them, just prolific editors publishing in their own periodicals, you know, then it starts to, starts to go down the other direction. So in terms of some other things that get discussed as well. Um, oh yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna populate some numbers in here, but I didn't get the chance while Rink's presentation was going. So I'll post these at the end. So some other things that get discussed. So again, Elizabeth Pick mentioned this this morning that, um, that she had submitted uh, to the, the editors of journals that uh, about some, some images manipulation and um, five years later, 60% of editors had had not done anything. So we talk about retraction inertia or hesitancy to retract as well as disguising retractions and sometimes just disappearing articles. Uh, we talk about bias in terms of gender and prestige, nationality, publication, confirmation, lots of biases. Um, there's instances of speeding up and slowing down peer review um, as well as IP theft and failures to disclose conflicts of interest and then what rink have been talking about the notion of, of editors changing reviewers' comments. So these are some, some things that get highlighted in the literature. Just to focus in a little bit more on editors alting, the notion of editors alting ring reviews, I thought I'd just give a quick background on some of the things that I've come across across my journey in looking into this. Interestingly, there are historical reports of, um, of secretariats back in the days of the Royal Society of London rewriting reviews, and they did this to disguise referees' handwriting. And I, I couldn't resist not putting this in. Obviously, this did lead to some people getting a bit upset about it. So this is a, a piece in Nature in, in 1871 by an Italian-born British astronomer, Charles Piazzi Smith. And um, he submitted a paper that I think they sat on for seven months and then rejected and then published something similar. And so he, he, he basically wasn't very happy about it. Um, and particularly... He wasn't particularly, he got a bit of a nasty response by the sounds of it after asking to know the names of the identities of the people who were refereeing his paper. And then goes on to say that um, he can't understand what any scientific society in the present day has got to do with the accursed thing in all national history represented by secret committees, secret members, secret judgments, veiled prophets, and goes on. So going to more current issues, um, as Rink has said, he's touched on a couple of them in his presentation. We do see instances of uh, editors removing offensive language 
from reviews. So there's been a, a code form case specifically dedicated to this. We see instances of editors uh, correcting false statements, uh, quote unquote, as well as removing excessive cell citation requests. We see this practice of ultimatum editing coming up, um, which I'll explain in a second, as well as Rink's uh, situation of, of where recommendations of reviewers might actually get changed. So in terms of ultimatum editing, uh, there was a case where uh, the editor basically said, basically accept my chops on your rejoinder and get it published soon or take your critic elsewhere. So it's a bit of a long story, that one, but to suffice it to say the editor put a, uh, an ultimatum to the, the reviewers to make the changes or to rescind. So basically, um, this was something that was sent to me by an editor-in-chief of a journal that I know, and this is what editor-in-chiefs actually see now. So they get a prompt saying, please check the comments that reviewers have intended for the author, edit where necessary. So just to quickly go through, we performed a survey because we were interested in these practices and it ran in 2019. And we were looking at some of these peer review practices and policies, as well as we asked editors their views on some issues as well to do with these things. Just to focus in on what Rink had said in that situation, we did ask editors in what circumstance they thought it would be acceptable for another editor to alter a reviewer's report without a permission. And we put seven situations to them. And these are the results that we got back. So I've just uh, ordered these from sort of the most acceptable to the least. Um, and so most, you know, 62% of editors told us that they think it would be okay to remove comments that were left specifically in for an editor uh, in, the, in a review report just for the editor. And we surprisingly saw that 8% of editors said that they think it's okay to, to alter a report if they disagree with a recommendation. I was gonna put in, again, the numbers from the audience, but I won't be able to do that. So I'll post my slides at the end um, of the talk when I update those numbers. So just to wrap up the presentation, um, I thought I'd focus just quickly on, in terms of the policy landscape for editing reports, I mentioned there's a Cope, a Cope Forum case where they talked about um, a PI getting some not very constructive uh, feedback from a reviewer and the Cope Forum agreed that they thought it was okay for publishers uh, or for editors to edit these comments out. Um, and they, so they recommended that. And then more recently, Cope had a discussion specifically on this issue and actually released guidance on it on, I think Wednesday, which I quickly read this morning. And the cliff notes are effectively that um, they recommend that journals develop a policy on what's considered acceptable conduct for reviewers, as well as when or if edits may be made. They don't have a problem with edits for tone or language, but they do for meaning and intent. Um, and that they suggest that if you were as an editor to, to want to edit a report or alter a report that the reviewers should obviously be informed and ideally the edit should be in collaboration with those reviewers. And finally, if, if a journal goes down the pathway of, of having a blanket no editing um, policy to, to provide authors about how to address um, some of the comments by reviewers. So this is more of a genuine thing than me, but I thought I'd quickly raise here. This is obviously the policies that COPE has come across, but I'd be interested to hear from Ginny next about some of the mechanisms that we, that we have in place to ensure that these policies are developed and complied among COPE members. And then recognizing that there are not a, a lot of self-regulation measures out there for journals, um, what we might do or, or what happens for, for people who aren't COPE members. So the very last slide that I wanted to quickly talk through is um, as I was pulling these slides together, I came across a blog by Philip Cohen and he was looking at coercive self-citation practices and he had put up this quote from a, an editor who asked this question to themselves when they were trying to think about whether they thought something was ethical or not. And they said, would I as an editor feel embarrassed if my activities came to light and would I therefore object if I was publicly named? And when I read this, it made me think about that most of the time, none of these things are, are, are public. So, and then this is, it seems like a bit of a truism, but obviously the more opaque the system is, the more difficult it is to investigate some of these practices. And just for a little bit further context, for our survey, we had noted that 8% of our respondents didn't have a review, a policy on governing editing reports, and 15% didn't actually share all reports with all reviewers. And other studies have shown that it can be up to about 50% that don't. In terms of self-citation, uh, we know that 1% you know, of journals in our, or in our survey, 1% of journals didn't publish reports, signed or unsigned, which is consistent with some other studies that have looked into this. 
And then just some other questions I raised to everybody about um, you know, how many journals adopt a system similar to PLOS One that publishes the name of handling editors on the papers. And presumably no journals provide any detail on info on rejected articles as well. So my final question to everyone would be, could increasing transparency in some of these domains be a good first step to deter some of these behaviours? So I'll leave it there. I've gone a little bit over time. Yeah, thanks. We're, we're going to move very quickly now into Jenny's talk. Jenny, do you want to share your slides with us now? And then after Jenny's talk, we'll have some closing remarks from Samin Vizier. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, okay. That's all good. Yep. All right. Fantastic. Well, look. Thanks very much for um uh, for the opportunity to do this. Thanks to the organisers and uh, to everyone who's hung on in there wherever you are. It's a beautiful uh, morning, Saturday morning in Brisbane, which is where I'm based. Um, I work at QUT. I'm also the director of a work a group called Open Access Australasia. Um, and I was chair of COPE from 2012 to 2017. But I just want to make it really clear. I'm speaking. On my own behalf here i'm not speaking on behalf of cope um but i'm more than happy to kind of discuss any of these um these issues so um just to go through quickly so i just this one i want to talk about what cope is um uh its role in the wider publishing ethics landscape a bit about how it actually works um and then uh some obvious and perhaps so not so obvious editorial misbehavior including one of my um sort of hobby horses at the moment which i'll come on to at the end that i'd love to have a, a discussion about so COPE is the Committee on Publication Ethics. Um, it was started back in 1997. In fact, Richard Smith, who Dan uh, mentioned just there, was one of the founding editors of it. Um, it was uh, three blokes, of course, because mostly editors then were blokes. Uh, Richard Smith, uh, Richard Horton of The Lancet, and uh, um, the editor of Gut, Michael Farthing. And they got together to kind of talk about the sort of ethical issues they were seeing at their journals. Um, and this timeline talks about, uh, shows really what's happened since then. Um, I was the editor from 2012, uh, sorry, the, um, the chair from 2012 to 2017, mostly when I was uh, working at PLOS Medicine. And during that time, I, the membership expanded enormously from you know, three back in 1997, and it's now got more than 12,000 members. It's a voluntary membership organisation, so um, the journal's editors pay to be members of it. Uh, it's not an enforcement agency. We can have a conversation about whether it should be or whether there's a need to have that. And in fact, we've had that conversation over the the various uh, over, over the years. But what we have found, and one of the key things that I think has happened with COPE over the years is, is it's become increasingly hard for reputable journals not to be a member of COPE because of the work that it does. And it's a great example, I think, of how you can improve behaviour by um, changing the norms within the industry more generally. The other thing just to note, of course, is the vast majority of editors are actually academics themselves. You know, it's entwined into the um, uh, publishing system. And so what every every time we talk about an editor, we're pretty much often talking about um, people who also work as academics and the whole system itself, I think, is sort of intertwined together. And you can see here the, the statement from the COPE website that I that I've grabbed, which is that it, its purpose is to ensure ethical practices become part of publishing culture. Um, and they do this through a whole range of routes, most of which um, are freely available on their website. And I'd encourage you to look at them if you're if you're interested. The main thing that COPE has is a set of core practices here. So there's 10 of them that are lined up here um, that range from allegations of misconduct, and that can be against authors, but also against editors. And I'll touch on some of those in a second. Um, through to um, some, uh, some of, the, I think, of the hardest issues that uh, COPE deals with, which are around post-publication discussions and corrections. And we heard earlier today from Elizabeth Bick, who has done some astonishing work in sort of, um, you know, looking at uh, issues of problems with papers and trying to get them corrected or retracted. And that has been one of the hardest things for journals to manage. And I, you know, freely admit that this is by far from a perfect system right now. And one of the problems that we have is that there is no easy way to correct the literature right now. And that, that I think, has led to sort of all sorts of issues um, within the sort of leading to the, in the reliability of the of sort of what's published. Um, COPES is, there are other groups around. So um, uh, I've just noted up here, the Council of Science Editors, which is mostly um, uh, US based. There's the European Ac Association of Science Editors. Both of them have uh, work that they do on publication ethics. And um, at the bottom, I put the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors that also came up in a, a talk earlier, um, which is not really a body that 
uh, uh, sort of deal, deals with ethics on a large scale, and it is actually a relatively small core group that are part of the ICMJ, but they can do some really important stuff. And one of the things that the ICMJ, ICMJ did do was uh, mandate trial registration um, uh, in, uh, and that led to um, a really important change across the entire industry so that now it's virtually impossible to publish a clinical trial in any reputable medical journal if it's not registered. And that was the work of the ICMJ taking a stand on that. So um, let's just, uh, I just wanted to talk then about some, uh, how COPE uh, works and what, how it's sort of, um, how it's a sort of reflection of what the editorial issue, the ethical challenges are. So um, the main way that it works is through a discussion of cases that happen at member forums, and these are all freely available. They're all anonymized and they're on the COPE website. And so uh, back in 1999, and the, you can see the case number there, the first bit indicates which year it was published in, um, that they were already taught, thinking about the integrity of the uh, of the editors themselves. Um, this was a case where the um, editor um, uh, recommended that a paper was rejected, but in fact the editor went against it and for reasons that are not apparent actually accepted the, um, uh, the, the paper in, in a way that was probably inappropriate. Um, another example of how the cases rec re reflect what's happening in the in the sort of wider publishing industry, uh, publishing more generally. This is a case from from 2012, and this was at a time when we started to see um, a compromised peer review peer reviews being submitted to journals. And this was a sort of an early this this case in particular is an early reflection of what later came to be a really rather quite massive issue, which was um, the sort of paper mills that were published um, along with fabricated peer reviews. Um, and the reason for that was because of the need for um, authors, particularly from some from some countries in particular, to get their papers published. And that there was a wide scale um, wholesale attempt to, to subvert the whole publishing industry, as it were, through um, fabricating papers and fabricating peer reviews. But I just want to finish by talking about editorial sort of what I think is modern editorial misbehavior and, and to tie it back into what I think is the a sort of really big issue that we need to think about more, more generally. So um, we've heard about this already from, from Dan, but this issue of editors and reviewing reviewers requiring authors to cite, cite their own work is actually unfortunately quite common. Um, this is a paper where um, actually a staff member in an editorial office noted that a particular um, editor was asking reviewers authors to cite papers by themselves and these were uh, happened much more often th than when they asked them to cite when there were papers that they were uh, not co-authors of um this led you know there's further work that things that happened so this this is where the um editor was actually particularly trying to manipulate their impact factor and the way that they were doing that was asking for specific references to publications in their own journal uh, and only for publications at a time frame that would have, that would affect the impact factor and then even perhaps even more egregiously um this is a paper from from more recently where um uh one particular editor noticed that another journal editor had figured out how to massage the impact factor by publishing um, annual reviews that upped the um, number of citations to their own journal and thought this might be quite a good idea to do themselves. And so you can see how sort of poor behaviour um, populates itself across across the industry. But the problem is this, this isn't new at all. And so I just want to come back to thinking about editorial misconduct overall and think about how it ties into the overall um, uh, publication and sort of scholarly landscape, really. Um, when I was at one of the editors at PLOS Medicine back in 2006, we published this paper called The Impact Factor Game. And, and what became really clear to us when we first um, started publishing and actually thinking about what the impact factor for our journal might be at that time is that the whole system was completely corrupt and was already um, uh, entwined with um, things such as uh, how journals were um, perceived by um, society more widely, and that it was possible to actually uh, manipulate impact factors by having discussions with the organisation that that, that um, ran the impact factor at that time, and which was pretty opaque to most academics. And so what we, what we ended up with is a system that journals played um, because they knew their authors needed to care about it, um, in that they would uh, attempt to uh, manipulate their impact factor to encourage authors to publish there. And this leads to a vicious cycle that we know that we have right now. 
I don't have time to go into the whole body of work that's been shown that, you know, the attempt for um, at the authors who try to publish in um, high impact factor journals are more likely to try and cut corners. But we know that the whole system itself is highly problematic in that, you know, one particular system that we have um, leads to um, misbehaviour sort of across the academic publishing more generally. So I'll just finish with a few things I thought we might kind of have a think on. I think, you know, let's talk about ethical issues of editors, but I think it's part of the wider um, academic system more generally. Um, how much do we care about manipulation of citation impact factors? And if so, do we have a better system? And then, of course, there are a whole range of initiatives that are thinking about this right now, including the Declaration on Research Assessment, um, the Leiden Manifesto, um, the Hong Kong principles, all of which are trying to think about how we might move away from the sort of the system that we have that leads to the editorial misconduct that I think is sort of highly problematic. So I'll stop there and hope to have a good discussion. Great, thanks so much. Um, that was a great set of talks. So I'll keep my comments brief so that we have a lot of time for discussion. There's already some great questions in the comments. Feel free to add more questions in the Q&A or comments. Um, so I think one theme for me and, and my experiences being an editor is I'm, I was really shocked at how little accountability and transparency there is on the part of the editors themselves that we can do a lot and get away with a lot. Um, and people just assume that we're, we have good intentions and we're benevolent and so on. And part of it is, as Jenny mentioned, that the most majority of editors are academic editors. So we're doing this you know, on top of a full-time job. And I think people recognize that this is very a, a big service, but I think that sometimes comes with a feeling that therefore we don't need any oversight. We don't need to be concerned about what editors are doing. Ring's story, I think, not just what happened, but the lack of consequences, I think, is is really really concerning. It's just that maybe there there is no recourse. There is no one watching the editors. No consequence. I mean, obviously, it's it's a single case, but there still hasn't been a consequence in that case, um, which is really really shocking to me. And this is a case where you know there's not much ambiguity here. But more generally, I think um, there's, you know, we probably all had this experience of hearing an author's story, maybe on social media, maybe, you know, through the grapevine about an unfair or biased review or decision letter. And I'm often in a position where I just don't know what to believe. Like, I think authors sometimes see things through a distorted lens or misremember, things like that. But I do think sometimes ed reviewers and editors are biased. And um, right now, there's not really a good way for this to come to light. And I think there's a few things we could do to increase the transparency and accountability of editors and of journals. And we spend a lot of time talking about the transparency of authors, but I think we really need to be talking about how we can increase transparency of the process of peer review and then our ability to hold editors and journals accountable. So one really simple thing, I mean, it's, it's a bit more complicated, but just transparent peer review for published articles. So if an article is accepted, the journal could publish the peer review history and that doesn't mean identifying the reviewers, it just means publishing whatever would be normally just shared with authors, the decision letter and reviews, whether they're signed or not, um, publishing that along with the paper so everybody can look at the peer review process. That doesn't completely solve the problem because that only applies to accepted papers and probably most of the problematic things happen in rejected papers. And there's a couple of solutions to that. One extreme one would be overlay journals where all the peer review history is published as it, as it goes along. And so there are some of those actually, so metapsychology in the field of psychology does this, and I'm sure there are some in other fields, but I think a, a less drastic step, and I'm for overlay journals, I, I think that's great. But if we're not ready for that, I'm, the minimum I think journals should do is have a policy that authors are allowed to share and post their own decision letters and reviews that they receive from the journal, however widely they want. So they can share it with other scholars, they can post them publicly on their blog or on their preprint or whatever. Um, that information should be, first of all, the authors should be able to share it with whoever they want. And second of all, it's only by allowing even rejection letters and, and, and reviews from rejected papers to be shared that we might be able to detect patterns of bias or unfairness or corruption. Sometimes it's not clear from an individual decision that an editor is biased or, or engaging in corrupt practices, but only if we can see a pattern across multiple rejection letters could we see that pattern. And so I think that should be uncontroversial. It should just be a right of authors to post their decision letters and reviews if they want to, um, even for rejected papers. Um, um, I think this also raises some interesting questions about the distinction between uh, academic editors and professional editors. So there are some journals where the editors are full-time staff and paid their, a salary for their job. And I think that um, 
some of the attitudes that I've felt as an editor, as an academic editor is almost like too much generosity and too much charity and interpretation of editor's behavior because of our dual roles as academics. So first of all, like it's challenging for people to, to challenge me because I'm a senior academic in the field. And if they you know, upset me as an editor, that might affect their chances of getting a job in my department or something like that. They could be worried about that. So there's some advantages, I think, to a professional editor model. Um, and also, I think it helps us think of it more as a job with, that comes with responsibilities. It's a very, very powerful job. So it should come with a lot of responsibility, not lower standards. I think it should come with higher standards. I'm not saying that there's everything is better in the professional editor model, but I think it's, it's an interesting way to think about the pros and cons and different ways of kind of thinking about the responsibilities and privileges of being an editor. So I'll wrap it up there and, and turn to the questions from um, the audience. So, I mean, one, I think we've mostly dealt with this, but Jason asked about whether publishing peer reviews along with articles would deter this behavior. Um, so that would deal, that would work for accepted papers, right? But it doesn't work for rejected papers since those aren't necessarily published. Um, so I'll maybe combine that with uh, one or two other comments and throw it to the panel and see who wants to comment on these. Um, there's another question from Cooper that's related to this, which, which is, are there any good examples of journals that are already increasing transparency and editorial practices, which journals and publishers are moving in the right direction? So I'd love to hear from people about that. And there was another question about whether people know about um, misbehavior and peer review for grants and whether funding agencies ever engage in this kind of editing, you know, surreptitious editing. Um, so let's start with maybe those questions of like, what are some examples of journals or funding agencies doing things right or wrong and what, what might help? And I'll throw that to any of the panelists that wanna address those issues. Well, I'll, t I'll take the first pass. I mean, so I think that the BMJ actually has been a kind of leader in this for many years, and um, that's the field that I'm most familiar with. Um, they published open peer reviews for a very, they have signed peer reviews and they've for a very long time and they, um, you know, publish open peer reviews when they uh, for, as well. Uh, the BMC series of journals do that. We had this long conversations about doing this at PLOS when I first started. And to be honest, back then it wasn't anything that people were willing to consider. And so we, you know, pick one battle at a time. We were fighting a battle on open access. So that was the battle that we chose to fight there. But I am increasingly of the view that, you know, with you, Samin, that these things should be published, they should be open. And I think that, you know, they don't have to necessarily be signed, but they make it's a huge step towards transparency if, and kind of just accountability. I do think editors have a role themselves in holding each other accountable. And that's one of the purposes of COPE is that, you know, you raise the norms within the profession and, you know, profession, I include, you know, um, editors who do it as, as, as academics. You know, you have to understand what good behavior looks like. And, and that is often, you know, a lot of people who come into being an editor, to be honest, don't get a lot of mentorship. And I think that's, again, some one of the things that professional organizations like COPE can help to do. Does anyone else want to jump in? Something I was going to mention was um, in that same survey that we did, I think of, of the respondents that we had, so the general editors, and most of which were lead editors, I think something like 35 or 40% said they were happy with the way that they were conducting peer review. So a lot of people seem to be set and, and, and content with the way that they're operating. And then of the people who said that they were intent on making some changes, most often when it comes to things like transparency, say taking um, blinding as an issue, they wanted to increase anonymity, not open it. And um, some of the things that I had seen on that front tended to be a fear of alienating reviewers, given how difficult it is at the moment to get reviewers. Um, I think there's there's a fear that by opening up or becoming more transparent, it makes your life more difficult in getting reviewers to review for you. Something that I had noticed on this note. Yeah, I think there's now some empirical data on this. I mean, it's all a bit hard to interpret, but I think the evidence so far suggests that it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, there's different models of transparent review. There's ones where authors can opt in or out and reviewers are just told which situation they're in, if their reviews will be posted publicly, if the paper's accepted or not, or others where it's up to the reviewers to opt in or out and authors have no say in it. And then there's some journals like um, the journal I'm editor of at Collabra, which just require transparent review. It's not optional. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the issue of like the tension between masking the identities of authors 
versus transparent review, I, I think they're often conflated, but they're pretty orthogonal. You can publish the peer review history regardless of what you decide to do about whether reviewers' identities stay hidden or authors' identities stay hidden or not. Um, so I think we should distinguish between openness and transparency about the content of the reviews and editors' letters versus the identities of the people behind them. Um, feel free to jump in, panelists, if you have any other thoughts. Another question someone asked is, should a distinction be made between stealth editing of reviews and transparent editing? So if you fix the typo, for example, but bracket it, um, I think that's definitely, uh, it's very, it's good to be more transparent about it. I think another, there's kind of different degrees of positions about what's okay. And my own personally is that I think you should always get the reviewer's consent before editing. I could imagine. So part of my reason for having a pretty extreme view is that it's such a slippery slope and seeing George Markalides say that he still continues to edit reviews for inappropriate comments. I'm like, I don't trust your judgment anymore. And it really makes me feel like we shouldn't leave it up to individual editors judgment. So even something like a typo now, I think I would try to err on the side of just either not fixing it if it's too much trouble to go to the to the trouble of contacting the reviewer or contacting the reviewer. If it's a big enough typo that I want to fix it, then make sure the reviewer is on board. And I'm, I leave no room for motivated reasoning on my part to be like, I'm just fixing a typo. I have a very brief thought on that. Um, in the new COPE guidelines, they had mentioned about, you know, that it's okay in some instances to change tone. Um, part of me was thinking that if editors were to go ahead and do that, then it makes it quite difficult for people to actually study how common some of these actions are. So, how, so there are obviously some, some data into, into more nastier reports and trying to get an understanding of that. And if we were to, to edit these, um, it might make it a bit difficult to kind of get a, get a grip on how common or, or uncommon some of these issues are. I also think the line between tone and substance is so blurry. I just don't trust humans to rely on <laughs> that distinction. Well, I, I just make one quick comment on that is that, you know, having, you know, seen lots of reviews, I've got to say editors, uh, sorry, all reviewers often don't, uh, don't aren't oh, very nice, <laughs> you know, not to put too fine a point on it. And as an editor, I think one of your jobs is to is to kind of act as the you know the negotiator between the reviewers and the authors and you know i often used to write um, editors letters that kind of said you know despite what x says we think y i mean we had we did used to have discussions about you know the kind of tone of reviewers and in the end what we did was if people were unnecessarily rude we would just never use them again but you know it's a really difficult thing to do you know we've rarely if ever edited reviews i mean i actually can't remember ever doing it but you know, I did feel incredibly uncomfortable passing on just frankly nasty reviews to authors, you know, which unfortunately you know is more common than you'd, you'd hope, really. Yeah, I think sometimes editorial misconduct arises out of editors feeling that their hands are tied, and that like in the case of Rink's paper, maybe George Markalides was justified in rejecting the paper, sorry Rink, and maybe Fiona's review was wrong and the other reviewer was right, but he just needed to own that decision and say, despite one positive review, I'm going to reject it for these reasons. And so I feel like sometimes it's just so oh, easy way out instead of fully standing up to reviewers or authors or whoever you need to stand up to. That's exactly right. It's about standing. It, you know, we, we used to say this all the time. You're the editor. You're the one that makes the decision. You have to own the decision. And, you know, the review, you can't hide behind reviewers. All right. I think there was a question about where people can find the results of the poll if um, they're not on Slack. Maybe Dan can quickly answer that. Yeah. Um... I'm not sure whether this year, whether the Meta Science Symposium has created an OSF page. If they have, I'll post it on there. Um, I'm not sure if there's another better way of doing well, this. I have also shared your email address with all of the attendees. Yeah, well, absolutely. Please <laughs> Or maybe one of us, I can tweet it out if that's okay. Or do you not yeah, want absolutely. it? Okay, I'll tweet it out from the Slack. Uh, if you're not on Twitter or on Slack, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> email it. Email them. Yeah. Any last thoughts in the last minute we have? Thanks, Rink, for joining us so late. <laughs> and thank oh, you, well, everybody, thank you. for yeah. coming. All right, I think that wraps up our session.
Um, okay, I think that's it. Okay, I'll um, I can close it for you. Uh, thanks everyone Thank you. for a great session. Um, I'll just put in the chat that if you want to continue the discussion on all of this topics, um, I'm just putting in the chat the link to the Remo uh, site. Um, where you can do some further networking with everybody. Um, and I think the next, there's a half hour networking session now, and then otherwise hope to see as many of you as possible for tomorrow's day three um, of Meta Science 2021. So thanks everyone for joining. Everyone. Thank you.